Well, let's pray. Jesus, we cannot sing those words without remembering why it is that you are worthy. You are worthy because as the second person of the triune Godhead, you condescended to come into this world and to be born of a woman and to live a perfect life and to preach a gospel of repentance and faith in you. And then you took your innocent life and you went to a cross and bore in your own body the sins of all of those who had put their trust in you. And Jesus, you suffered the full weight of your Father's wrath against all of that sin. Jesus, you were obedient to the point of death. You entered into death, conquered death. You conquered the sin that was the cause of that death. Together with your Father and the Holy Spirit, you raised yourself from the dead. You ascended into heaven and you sit enthroned, ready to return to this earth. You are petitioning your Father for us at this very moment. Jesus, the day will come when you leave that heavenly abode and you descend upon this earth to establish your rule and reign and everybody will know that you are the King, the only King. We are here today, Jesus, because of what you did for us. So we worship you and we praise you. Father in heaven, I pray that as we look at your words tonight, that you would be exalted. You would instruct us from your words. That when we leave here tonight, we would be filled with a greater awe, a greater wonder at who you are and what you would do in establishing the church and giving your son headship over that church. Grant us your grace, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, welcome once again to our Sunday evening service. This is our installment of the 66 books, and we are on the book of Titus. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Titus? Titus is the third of the three pastoral epistles. Paul is writing to Titus, and he is helping him understand how it is that he is to establish and fortify the church in Crete. Before we get into the letter itself, what we want to do is take a look at Titus himself and who is he? Why is it that Paul left him on Crete? What is so special about him? We're going to walk through a timeline of Titus's life, and what we'll do is we'll see some significant events that caused God to that God sovereignly orchestrated that caused Paul to put his trust in Titus. It's likely that Paul met Titus on his first missionary journey and led him to faith in Jesus Christ, and the timeline on that is somewhere around 46 to 48 A.D. Just a few years after that, uh, Paul returned from his first missionary journey and was stationed in Antioch, and he was reporting back about the success that took place on his missionary journey. And turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, because we're going to take a look at what happens there. Uh, there was this occasion called the Jerusalem Council. We're going to see what took place. While you're turning to Acts 15, I'm going to read a couple of verses from Galatians chapter 2. Paul explains in Galatians 2 that he went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. And this is important, verse 3 of Galatians chapter 2. Not even Titus, who was with Paul, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. It tells us a little bit about Titus, that he understands that salvation is by grace through faith. We're going to see a little bit more of this. When we go back to Acts 15, we see what is taking place. Again, Paul is in Antioch, and some men come down from Judea, and they begin teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. It's important to know that at this time, Titus is with Paul in Antioch. Verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had not had a little dissension and debate with them, the brothers determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them would go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. Drop down to verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you have some Jews, Christians, demanding that Gentiles must go and undergo circumcision. And so Titus is attending Paul and Barnabas as they go to Jerusalem to figure this out and sort this through, and he is listening to this discussion. This is a heavy, heated, very involved conversation. And so Titus, in the course of all of this council, hears a full explanation from Paul and Barnabas 
to the Jews in Jerusalem about the sufficiency of salvation by grace through faith. And this is really important because Titus needed to know that salvation did not involve any human means whatsoever. That was going to be important later on. So this is in the very early 50s, perhaps 50 AD or so. Then we advance about five more years to the year 55. And at this time, Paul is stationed in Ephesus, and he's on his third missionary journey. And we know from our, our lesson on 2 Corinthians a few weeks back that there was a lot of trouble in the church in Corinth during the time when Paul was pastoring in Ephesus. And so Paul made a visit to Corinth to try to settle the issue. And what was taking place there was the fact that uh, there was some false teaching within the church that had arisen, and these men wanted to assert themselves as the ones who had the truth and not Paul's gospel that Paul had taught to them. So Paul visited them in person to resolve the issue with them, and the issue did not get resolved. It did not go very well. In fact, what had happened was the church pretty much in its entirety got behind the false teachers, and they rejected Paul. And so Paul went home a very sorrowed, grieved man. And that was the occasion for his third letter to them, the letter he wrote to them between what we have as 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And it's referred to as the sorrowful letter, or the letter of grief, the hard letter. But the significant point for tonight is how the letter got from Paul in Ephesus to the church in Corinth. The delivery person was Titus himself. We can see that if you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 5 and 6. So Titus hand carries the, the sorrowful letter from Paul in Ephesus to the church in Corinth. Paul writes, and he's discussing the response of the church in Corinth. And this will tell us a lot about Titus while Titus was dealing with the church after delivering the letter to them. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 and 6, If any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree to all of you. But God who comforts the humbled comfort us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort which with he was comforted in you as he reported to us back in Ephesus, your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Notice the phrase there, the coming of Titus. Titus delivered the letter, and then he stayed with them. He spent time with the church. The church received the letter, and they worked through the letter. And no doubt that was a very difficult time for Titus, because this church had just rejected Paul a short time earlier. The false teachers were still there. Titus was patient with them. He spoke with them. He taught them. He instructed them. All of this requires the kind of depth and background and, and foundation in the word of someone who is really well mature in the Lord. And at this time, Paul trusted Titus to do this. So that's about A.D. 55. It turns out that Paul wanted to hear and he wanted to know how things went. So he left to find Titus. And he could not find Titus originally. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but saying farewell to them. I went on to Macedonia. It turns out that Titus and Paul actually did hook up in Macedonia. And they had a good time when Titus related to him exactly what it was that took place and that Titus actually led them towards a position of repentance over their sin. We also know that Paul trusted Titus with gathering the collection that was being taken in Macedonia to the aid of the poor church in Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. So we encourage Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would complete also in you this gracious work. Chapter 8, verse 16, But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. Drop down to verse 23 in 2 Corinthians 8. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. That's a good affirmation. When you get an affirmation like that from Paul, you're doing well. So that's the kind of man that Titus was. He attended the Jerusalem council. He heard a full discussion, very compelling arguments from Paul and Barnabas as to salvation by grace through faith. He resolved the situation, carrying Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He waited, he answered questions, he dealt with them. He was patient, he was calm. There was a lot of tension over the situation. There were some self-styled, self-appropriating false teachers, and he handled them well. 
This is a man who knows what he's doing. This is a man who knows a lot about what he's doing. This letter takes place, uh, the receipt of this letter is about 63 or 64 AD. And so by the time Titus receives this letter, he had known Paul for 15 years. Uh, He was no rookie in his faith. He was well-established, well-traveled. He had seen a number of trials. He was sound in his faith. What we'll do now is we'll look at the the beginning of the letter. We're going to look at the first four verses of the letter, and then we're going to walk through six principles to establish and fortify the church. So let's go to chapter one and take a look at the introduction. The introduction is going to help us because it's going to show us things about Paul that put Paul in stark contrast to the false teachers that are in the church. And we'll see more and more references to the false teachers in the church as we go on. Reading verses one through four. As we read this, take occasion to notice what is true about Paul as we read. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the full knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which the God who cannot lie promised from all eternity, but at the proper time manifested his word in preaching with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our savior to Titus, my genuine child, according to our common faith, grace and peace from God, the father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can see some things right away in verse one about Paul's character. Look at the way he describes himself. He refers to himself as a slave. And again, this is probably the greatest theologian and the greatest missionary the world has ever known and refers to himself as a slave. That tells you about his humility. He doesn't draw attention to himself and the role that he has. He understands that he's a slave in in God's service. And this is what sets the Christian apart from the false teacher, as we'll see as we go on in a few minutes here. Their message gets set apart by the character of the one who's actually speaking the message. Paul also refers to himself as an apostle in verse 1. And we know what apostle means. It means a sent one. But it's important to draw attention to another significant fact when we see the word apostle. It's the one who is sent out with a very clear, very authoritative message. When you see the word apostle in your Bibles, in your New Testament, it's someone who is commissioned with the task of taking the true message, the gospel message, the clear authoritative scriptures. This can only be true if that person received that direct revelation from God himself. So Paul is identifying himself as one in a very small fraternity of men. These men were the ones that God chose to actually receive in their own mind and in their heart divine revelation from the Holy Spirit and then to write down that revelation in written form and then to go throughout the whole Roman world teaching that revelation itself. Paul is one of those men that God entrusted with the truth of the gospel. It tells us an awful lot about Paul. There's absolutely no question about the inerrancy or the infallibility of this word or anything that Paul wrote because all of it was received from the Holy Spirit in divine revelation. It tells us a little bit about Paul. He considers himself to be a slave. He knows he's an apostle. He's humbly holding that in his hands. We see the purpose for which he's writing as we continue on in verse one, for the faith of God's elect and the full knowledge of the truth. Paul is writing to strengthen their faith and to expand their knowledge of the truth. And this is really important. This is not just any knowledge. This is the knowledge of the truth. There is one truth. And Paul knows it is essential that these people believe that truth. Any Christian should have a strong knowledge, but that knowledge needs to be coupled together with the knowledge of the truth itself, especially in a place like Crete, which we'll see in a few minutes. And notice that the point of this knowledge is not just to have the knowledge itself. The point of this knowledge is that it is according to godliness. And what we see God doing here is God is drawing a straight line between knowledge and godliness. True knowledge goes beyond just understanding information. It's a particular knowledge and it's one that produces a godly life. And that's going to be another recurring theme in this book. And we see what this knowledge is aiming at here as we look at verse 2. The hope of eternal life, which the God who cannot lie promised from all eternity. And when we see the word hope, we really need to understand what Paul is getting at here. He is talking about the certain knowledge of a certain future event. He's not talking about wishing that something will take place or hoping that something takes place in the way that it's used today, but he's talking about a confidence in a certain future event. There's lots of false teaching on Crete. So Paul wants Titus to teach the churches something. What he wants to teach them 
is that God is trustworthy in his plan for salvation. And the evidence that God is trustworthy in his plan is that this plan has never changed. It's the same plan that God has had from all eternity. So this is a little bit about Paul. This is a little bit about his task, his aim as he's writing this letter. But in verse 4, you see the richness of his relationship with, with Titus. He writes and he says, To Titus, my genuine child, according to our common faith. The Greek word there for genuine means legitimate child. It's an attribute that goes beyond dispute. It's an attribute that makes somebody um, beyond question. It's a stronger attribute than even belonging in a family. It's an attribute that can only be caused by something such as and only by salvation. So Paul has this dear relationship with Titus. Titus is his true child. He led him to faith and he loves him dearly. So there are three ways that Paul stands out against the false teachers as we look at our introduction. Uh, He's a humble man. And that's in opposition to these false teachers. We'll see that they're proud men. Um, Paul is carrying and bearing and writing about the truth, which is different from the false teachers who are promoting falsehood. And thirdly, Paul is seeking to build up the body. He's seeking to strengthen them. And we understand from chapter one that the false teachers are actually upsetting the church. So that's a little bit about the introduction of the letter. What we're going to do is look at six principles that are essential to establish and fortify the church. This is important because Paul had left Titus behind on Crete for that very purpose, to establish the church and strengthen the church. And we're going to look at how he did that. The first of those principles is that a false gospel is known by outward sin. So we're going to start in verse 16 and kind of work our way backwards as we look at this. Let's read verse 16. Paul is speaking of the false teachers, and he says, They profess to know God, but by their works they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. So these false teachers have a profession. It's an outward profession, and it's a profession that is similar to the rest of the people in the church. And on paper, it looks like everybody else. They look just like the rest of them. They're at church, they're involved, and they know people, they're participating. But the key here is that a genuine profession is affirmed only by a holy life. And that's where they come up short. These men, their works deny Christ. This is not somebody else is making claims that they deny Christ. They themselves are denying Christ by their very actions. They themselves produce the claim and they are the active agent in denying Christ. And they're testifying against themselves by the way they behave and conduct themselves. So any claim of knowing Christ is refuted by the life they lead. And it's obvious, it's clear, it's plain as day, and we'll see that in the verses following. What you have here are men who don't really bear any outward sign of an inward change at all. These are men who know some words. The words don't always make sense, but they try to be compelling in their presentation of those words. What you see here is something that is not neutral. It's not that these men are neutral at all. It's blatantly obvious, and we see the way Paul describes these men. He describes them as being detestable. The idea there is that they're morally objectionable. Even by the standards of the world, these men are objectionable in their morals. They're disobedient. And this is an adjective that describes what's true about them in an ongoing way. These are men who are, they continue to be disobedient. They knowingly reject God's authority over them. And they're unfit is how Paul describes them. That's the the word that's used in the LSB, meaning that they're disqualified from the position that they've assumed. And if we look at verse 11, we see why it is that they do this. What motivates them? It's dishonest gain. So these are men who have all kinds of moral failures, all kinds of personal failures. In verse 12, Paul quotes, a proverb that is known by the people in Crete, and it's a a proverb that is 600 years old at the time that Paul quotes it. And it's one that a Cretan made about the people in Crete. Paul writes, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. What Paul is doing here is he is taking what is known about Crete, and he's saying those very same things are true about the false teachers. Crete was known as kind of the fantasy island. It was the party island. It was a place that was full of drunkenness and orgies and sensuality and every kind of possible distortion that you can imagine of the things that God created to be good. They've distorted them. 
And Paul is saying the behavior of those Jewish false teachers, and we'll see that they're Jewish here in just a bit, is no different from the cesspool of sin that the creed was so famous for, even among pagans. And this isn't unique to Crete. Uh, we see this in other places in the New Testament. And I want to show these to you, and it'll help, it will be helpful for us to turn to these places. So if you would, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at the first three verses. And we're going to see that this is a pattern in false teaching. On one hand, you have this proclivity towards permissibility and promiscuity and sensuality and sexual misconduct. And on the other hand, you have greed. And we'll see these two things here. Peter is writing, it's his second letter to the church, and he says, there will also be false teachers among you. He's telling them about the times to come. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. So you see the two categories that are being described there. Um, most of verse 1 is talking about, or verse 2 is talking about their sensuality, and verse 3 is talking about their greed. Those are the two areas where false teachers appeal, because it's very, very appealing to the world, and that's what motivates them. Jude also mentions the same thing. So flip to the right, just a couple of books, get to Jude. We're going to look at verse 4 in Jude. He says the very same thing. He says, certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand mocked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons, and this is what they do. They turn the grace of our God into sensuality, and they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So the bottom, Lord with, the bottom line with these false teachers is that they have no regard for God himself. And so if you don't have any regard for God, why would you have any regard for his instructions over your life? Why would you apply his truth to your life? So a false gospel is known. It is marked. It is identified by outward sin. That's the first thing that a church needs to be aware of. And any church needs to be aware of that. Uh, Titus needed to be aware of that as he was establishing good leadership in the churches. And we need to be aware of that today. Today it's a little more subtle. It's not always as outward and as blatant. Sometimes it is, but it can be very, very subtle. So we need to be careful about that. The second thing we want to look at tonight is that false teaching attacks at the atomic level. And by that, I mean it works at the smallest unit that it possibly can. It doesn't start large scale. It starts at a small level and works around in small pieces. And the, the idea here is that if you have no regard for God himself, then why would you have any care for the church that's what these false teachers are doing. They have no care for the church at all. It just doesn't bother them to take the purity of God's word and replace that purity with their own thoughts. Let's go to verse 10. We'll see what they're doing here, what these men are doing. Paul writes to Titus and he says, there are many rebellious men. They're empty talkers and deceivers. And here's where we understand where they're coming from, especially those of the circumcision. So they're empty talkers. And what this is not saying is they're not saying anything. This is saying that their words that they do speak are devoid of the truth. But he also says that they're deceivers. They're actively deceiving. They're presenting something false as inherently true. They're representing that what is true, or replacing what is true with what is not true. They're doing that intentionally. They're deceivers. And this is especially true among the circumcision. Jews, but more importantly, men who truly believe that salvation was contingent upon circumcision. That in order to be a part of the family of God, you must have the outward sign of circumcision. And this is what is at the heart of false teaching. It's a failure to take God at his word. It's, it's a willingness to replace the truth of what God has said that only he can do for man with something that man brings to God. We know that we're going to see that in verse 11 in chapter 2, where we say, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to men. The grace of God is what brings salvation to men. Men don't achieve, they don't, they don't procure, they don't obtain salvation for themselves. God brings salvation to man on his terms. God has said, you must look away from your self-sufficiency, and you must cast yourself completely on my mercy and my grace. 
The men of the circumcision say that you can bring about a human change, circumcise yourself, and the issue is resolved. The issue of your broken relationship will be solved by an outward sign. And that's attractive to the world. Just do this one thing and you'll be good. That's very attractive to the world. It may be attractive to the world, but it's very offensive to God, the God who designed salvation himself and the God who gave his own son for that salvation. Back in chapter 1, we see the effects of their sin, the effects of their deceit. These men must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families and they're teaching things they should not teach for the sake of dishonest gain. And here is where we see the, the idea of the unit of measure that Paul is working at. The false teachers don't start at the congregational level. They don't t- start at the corporate level for the church. They start at the family level. So what the false teachers would do is they would enter into houses and they would spread their false teaching house by house by house. Now the church in Crete was obviously a young church. It was a newer church, so it was very unlikely that there were lots and lots of mature believers. So you had a better chance of finding no mature believers in a house than you would if you approached the the church as a whole. And so this way, the false teachers would have a greater chance of success with their message if they addressed houses on a house-by-house basis rather than one time in, in the church itself. And as soon as you begin to weaken the families one by one, you begin to weaken the church. So false teaching is known by the fact that it approaches the, the attack at an atomic level first. I don't think this microphone likes me. I really don't think it likes me. I even tried the other ear. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let's do this. Let's move on to the third point and see what happens. Um, what we're going to look at now is that you have this setting for the church. You have these false teachers in the church. And what is taking place is that uh, they've upset the whole church. They're upsetting the families in the church. And here's where the leadership comes into view. Qualified leadership is necessary to protect the church. In verse 5, Paul says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So Paul has two tasks for Titus. Those tasks are to set in order what remains, and to appoint elders in every city. Setting in order what remains helps us understand something of what had already taken place. What had already taken place was that the gospel had been taken to a good majority of the island by Paul and Titus together. But it needed to be completed. So you have this this island that's been partially reached. There were people who knew the gospel and they had it, but there were other places that didn't, and Paul says we need to finish the work. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Every one of these churches needs elders. Appoint elders in every city. So this suggests that many of the cities did have elders, but they probably didn't have qualified leadership. And you think about the churches that did have elders. They had elders, but it it was probably the case that they didn't have too many qualified elders. They were all young believers, and they'd probably been influenced to some degree by the false teachers, not always having the discernment they need to identify one from the other. So identifying elder qualifications is certainly helpful to identify new men going forward, but it's also very important to identify those men who probably shouldn't be serving as elders. That was part of the reason why Paul was was writing. And this really underscores Titus's trustworthiness. Think about what Paul is doing here. He is saying, appoint elders in every city. Here's Titus. This letter is written to one man, and he has the task of going from church to church and appointing leadership in those churches. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult task to appoint uh, an elder in a church. We have nine men on our elder board, and we're appointing one man right now in that period of time. It's challenging for nine men to do. Imagine do, being the only person doing this and doing this in one church after another after another. That tells you something about the confidence that Paul has in Titus. Okay, we're going to go... Paul is going to spend some time helping Titus understand exactly what it is that he should be looking for. He says, we need to be looking for a man who is beyond reproach. This is really important. This man needs to stand apart. And what this means is that there's no accusation that can be leveled against him 
that will ever stick to the man. That it's not even worth making an accusation in the first place because his life is of such character in general that that accusation just won't stick. He needs to be the husband of one wife. And this is really important for a church. This makes a lot of sense. He needs to be a man who's not tempted in any way by sexual sin. And you can see why this is important in a church, because a man who's in a church is caring for all the people in the church, and probably half of those people are women. So he needs to know how to conduct himself when he's in relationship with these people. He needs to be a man who has faithful children. This does not mean he has only believing children. What this really means is this is a qualification that is still speaking to the man. It's speaking about the man, not about his children. And what it's saying is he needs to lead in such a way that his children are faithful to his leadership. He needs to be a hospitable man. That doesn't mean he's a good entertainer. It means that his home is a place where the sheep in his congregation come, come and receive care. They can enter into his house, they can sit down and they can share the burdens of their life. And they can receive the kind of care that they need. And that means that his house has to be a peaceful, organized, orderly place which speaks to the man again. He needs to love what is good. So he can lead his church in loving what is good, which is in contradiction to what the false teachers want. The false teachers want them to love what is not good. He needs to be sensible, which means he can assess things properly, including false teaching. I'll drop down to the, the last part of the qualifications. You see it there in verse 9 and following. He needs to hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with faithful teaching. It is very important in Crete, and it is important here in Tempe as well, that leadership in a church establishes the church in truth. They lead the church in truth, and the only way they can do that is if they know and they understand the truth themselves. So Paul is telling Titus, you need to find men who actually do know and understand the truth. And they need to be able to exhort and reprove. When they see a person who is living contrary to the gospel, they need to be able to take the truth of the gospel and correct that false living. They also need to be able to do that with a person who is teaching contrary to the, to the gospel. So Paul tells him what to do in verse 13. He says, this testimony is true. Reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. And the word reprove there is, is really, really instructive for us. This is what a, a good leader does. He reproves severely. And there's, there's two pieces to the Greek word here. And the first piece is a prefix that, that describes something being taken away from something else. And the second word, the main root of the word, is talking about to cut out. And so when he says reprove them, he's saying, in very clear terms, cut out the wrong thinking, cut out the wrong belief, cut out the wrong acting from their life. Reprove them in such a way that cuts out the chaff from their life. So the pastor is to strengthen the spiritual foundation of the true believers in the church. And Paul says in verse 15, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Paul is saying it's not the men themselves who carry the authority. It's the word of God that has the authority. And the men who speak it are speaking the authority. The authority is with God and it's in with God's words. And so they need to speak those words helping the people understand that those words come from God. And they carry the authority of God. In verse 14, he says, do not pay attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. There were Jewish myths that were circulating around that were very destructive to the church. What was taking place there was that people were focusing their attention away from the truth of the gospel onto things that were extra biblical. And they were making that their primary focus and their primary point of concern. There were also commandments of men that Paul wanted them to stay away from. Another thing that's a clear indicator of false teachers is that they generate their own rules and their own laws, and they lay them over and against the truth of Scripture. Paul says, beware of those things. Leave those things. Avoid those things. The leader in the church needs to be able to see those and recognize those things and, and teach his and lead his congregation away from them. So chapter one is largely about pastoral leadership in the church and the kind of man who is capable of leading and protecting a church. But chapter two turns the corner and begins to put the focus on the people who are in the church. And Paul is gonna talk about five different categories of people and, and the ink here takes up one quarter of the entire letter as he speaks to older men and older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves. <clears throat> 
And so here's where our fourth point comes in, a fourth way in which a church needs to be established and fortified in the truth. That is that corporate holiness confronts the false gospel. So the character of the people themselves is going to expose the false gospel for what it really is and the false teaching for what it really is. So Paul starts in chapter 2 and verse 1, and he says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The idea here with the word proper is that it's fitting. It's what accompanies sound doctrine. It's not the sound doctrine itself. So as Paul is describing the behaviors for all of these people, what he's doing here is he is saying, this is the behavior that goes with the truth. This is what you do as one who believes the truth. You need to believe this way. So the faithful Christian lives what's in accord with the true gospel. And he starts with older men. He says, older men are to be temperate and dignified and sensible, sound in the faith and in love and in perseverance. Here, Paul is starting with the place that he should start. He's starting with men and he speaks about men and he's recognizing that there is a spiritual equality in the men and the women, but there is a role distinction between the man and the woman. God's design is for the man to set the standard for holiness of life and for the women to follow that man. So Paul also specifically starts with the older men. They are to be exemplary to the younger generation because they are the one who have fostered a love of God over the years. This may not have been true in a very, very young church like Crete, as much as it is true in a more established church like we have today. Paul lists two sets of three characteristics about these men. He said they need to be temperate, which means they don't entertain unbounded thoughts. They keep their thoughts within a narrow range of what they know to be true. They keep their behavior within a narrow range as well. If you want a good word picture of what that looks like, just think about a temperate rainforest. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. They stay in the middle. They need to be dignified men. And this does not mean that he's a stuffy man. And he's just a very formal man. What this means is that the man has a very serious demeanor about sin. He has a very serious demeanor towards holiness of life, towards the church. He doesn't take lightly the things that really matter. And he needs to be sensible. That means that worldly standards have no appeal to him. He looks at the things of the world and he uses biblical standards to evaluate those. He's not swayed by the things of the world or by his own emotions. He needs to be those things, but he needs to be sound in three things. As he is a temperate man and a dignified man and a sensible man, he needs to be sound in his faith and his love and his perseverance. To be sound in faith means that nothing shakes your trust in God's promises. You understand those promises, you believe them, and there is nothing that will compromise your trust in those promises. To be sound in love means that your love for God is solid. It doesn't deteriorate and it doesn't crumble under circumstances of life. Your love for God, your love for people in the body of Christ continues regardless of your circumstances. Same thing is true about perseverance. He's sound in his perseverance. Hardships don't deter him from pursuing God and remaining faithful to God. But the result of all of these things is what needs to be put right in front of the false teachers. And that's the, a living testimony to the unbeliever of the winsomeness and the fruitfulness of living under God's authority. Because the false teachers, teachers were not living under God's authority. They were living under their own. And these older men are to lead the charge in showing the false teachers how good and how right it is to live under God's authority and God's design. Paul moves on to older women and he says, likewise, they are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. That means that they are to fear God. They're reverent. They have a fear of God. And that fear means that they're not afraid of God, but they draw near to God so that they can obey him and love him and regard him. Deuteronomy 6 is such a good place to see this. We know what Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart. So you have the idea of love for God at the beginning of Deuteronomy 6. But later in that same chapter, you have the ideas of obeying God and fearing God and not putting God to the test. So the fear of God exists right next to and in good proximity to an obedience for God and a reverence for God and a love for God. These women need to be that kind of person who actually love God well and they fear God well. And they can't be malicious gossips. And what this means is that it's a person who brings harm through speaking falsehood. The church can't be known for that. That's what the false teachers do. 
They need to stand apart from those people. They can't be enslaved to wine. Paul is describing here a person who has lost the battle to wine. They consistently use wine to distract themselves from the realities of life, from enjoying life the way God intended us to enjoy life. But they need to teach what is good. This is what is so important about an older woman. She needs to be ready to teach to younger women what she knows to be true from God's word. And again, the result of this is a living testimony to the false teachers and all the pagans around them of the rightness of living by God's design, not by the world's design. And the description of what is right for the younger women is what is taught to them by the older women. Verses four and five, they may instruct the young women in sensibility to love their husbands, to love their children, be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. Why? So that the word of God may not be slandered. There's seven characteristics here. And you see what Paul is getting at here is the household. When he speaks to the younger women and speaks of the younger women, what's in view here is the household, the very things that are getting upset by the false teachers. The near context in all of these things relates to the home because it's in the home where the woman is most ably able to express her love for her husband. Think back to Genesis chapter 2 where... God writes, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. The home is where the woman demonstrates that she is a helper suitable to her husband. She is for her husband. And so these seven characteristics of the woman are the way that she shows that. She bears that out in her household. We ask herself, well, does this forbid a woman to pursue endeavors outside of her home? The answer is obviously no, but whatever it is that she does, she needs to do it, and it needs to fit within her responsibility to be a helper suitable for her husband. We ask ourselves why that is so important, and we go to verse 10, and I've mentioned it a few times, but Paul says there were rebellious men, especially those of the circumcision. In verse 11, they're upsetting whole families, and they're teaching things they should not teach. So what Paul is doing is he's providing guidance. He's providing the way that these people should be living so they can respond rightly to the false teaching. The false teachers were breaking apart the proper function of the family. And the woman who loves her husband well by being a good helper suitable will be beyond the reach of the false teachers in Crete. So God's design for the household is that this single entity of a man and a woman, they have spiritual equality, they have role distinction, and they function well, and they, when they exercise those roles the way they should, that is to the benefit of the household as a whole. That is God's design. Paul also speaks about the younger men. They need to be sensible. They need to be sensible, just like the younger women they need to be sensible, and just like the older women, just like the older men. But with young men, there's more of a tendency among them than anybody else to be in, impulsive in the use of their own autonomy. Paul is saying that these men need to use good judgment in all things. Then Paul moves on to talk to slaves, and he says, they must be subject to their own masters in everything. They need to stand apart from the the pagan slaves, the sinful slaves. They need to have willing, joyful submission to what it is that their masters would have them do. And then they want to set apart themselves in that way. What we're going to do as we look at verses 11 through 14, see how this speaks to the fifth way that the church needs to be fortified. And that is that corporate holiness among all of the people in the church compels proper church relationships. We know this passage, this is one of the sweetest passages in the book. It's one of the sweetest passages in the New Testament describing how it is that God saves and what it is that believers do. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live sensibly, rightly, and godly in this present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. And this is where it all comes back to the power of the gospel as we see this. Notice the corporate aspect in verse 11. The grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to all men. Paul just got done describing five different groups of people. Salvation has appeared to those five groups of people. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, slaves. But look at what that grace does in a person. Look at what it does to the sinner. It brings salvation. It rescues the sinner from their penalty of their sin. So the gospel saves the sinner 
But it's really important for us to see that the gospel does something else as well. That is that the gospel actually instructs. It brings instruction. And look at who it brings the instruction to. It brings instruction to the saint. It instructs them to live sensibly and rightly and godly in this age. And Paul adds, in this age, today, grace mandates that there be a noticeable change in us on an ongoing basis because of what God did to us at the point of conversion. And that is not what you see in the false teachers. It's something that is present in them from day to day to day. Verse 14 tells us that God gave himself, Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify us for himself, a people for his own possession. And then the characteristic of those that Christ gave himself for is that they would be zealous for good works. So Paul has already established that grace saves. And the evidence that that grace has saved a person is that they are zealous for good works. The response of the one who has been saved is that they pursue the things that God has said are good. And this is the greatest testimony of all, that God saves a sinner and then he grants them the ability to walk in newness of life so they'll be able to put his grace on display. So this is the testimony that the church is to give. And then Paul closes to make sure that Titus understands how it is that he should present these truths to the people. He says it's for, them, for Titus to do three things. He says, speak and exhort and reprove. But then he says, do this with all authority. And there's a progression here. Speaking is a teaching. Exhorting is more of an entreaty or a plea. So you feel it growing in its strength. Reproving is a correction. So it's growing even stronger. It corrects all of those who are contrary to that teaching. So the man who's faithful in the preaching of God's word, he has the authority. Again, the authority is not really in the man, but it's in the word that he's speaking. Lastly, we'll look at corporate holiness and how it compels us in the world. If we look at chapter three, we're going to see some instructions on how it is that the congregation is to interact with the world. Chapter two being how they deal with one another. Chapter three relates to how they interact with the world around them. Paul starts in verses one and two by talking to them about their civic duty and their responsibilities as people in the culture. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, be obedient be ready to for every good work, slander no one, be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men. So the way that the Christian stands out against the world is by living with compliance to the worldly authority to a greater degree than the world does to its own authority. So the Christian can exceed and be a better citizen in this world than those who are of this world. Philippians 3 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. The citizenship of a believer is in heaven. And because it's from in heaven, we're waiting for the appearance of our Savior from heaven. We show our eagerness for Christ by living under this authority here in much the same way that we will live under the authority of Christ, joyfully, willingly submitting to that authority. We have a different citizenship, yet we're to be the most faithful, most responsible, most trustworthy people and residents in this world. So that's our responsibility in the world. And as we do that, we're to remember the condition that we used to be in. We see that in verse three. We ourselves once were also foolish and we were disobedient and deceived and enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. And we were spending our life in malice and envy. We were despicable and hating one another. The task of the Christian is to glorify God with their life. That includes the advancement of the gospel. That includes evangelism. And we're most effective at this when we remember the power that the gospel had to save us. So we're most confident of the gospel and its ability to save others. That increases our confidence in actually sharing the gospel when we remember what it did in our own life. So Paul wants the people in the church to remember their own salvation. Remember their former condition of what they were like. And in verse 4 through 7, he talks about their own salvation. When the kindness of God and affection of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's a lot of really rich, really sweet words in this passage. Paul talks about a kindness. What that means is that there is an undeserved favor from God. God is being kind to the one he saves. 
When Paul refers to God our Savior and reminds the believer that they need saving, there was a point in their life where they needed to be saved and that God actually saved us. It's right there at the beginning of verse 5. We needed to be washed, and that washing was through regeneration by the indwelling work, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. We actually needed a new constitution. We needed to be renewed. The Holy Spirit was the one who was doing that. The word justified there helps us understand that we needed to be brought into line with alignment with God and his holy character. And that's exactly what God did. God justified us by giving us the faith to believe in, in Jesus Christ. And Paul then speaks of heirs, that we have a citizenship that is beyond this world and gives us something to look forward to. These things remind us of our new condition and the grace we possess to function rightly in this world. So Paul wants the people in the church to understand all the things that are true about them so that they can be effective with the gospel as they take it to the lost people around them. When you look at verses 10 and 11, you see a warning as they're functioning in the church. Paul says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. This is referring to a man who loves to split apart what God has joined together. Think very carefully about what God did when he saves a person. Colossians 3 tells us that God rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of the son of his own love. That's what God does. God takes a sinner out of the world and brings him into his kingdom, the kingdom of his own son. And there is a unity. There is a oneness in that. So the factious man is a man who is seeking to divide that and split that and break that up and destroy what God is putting together. He is intent on breaking up a unity of what God has brought together. So those are an instruction to the church. The church is instructed, reject that person. We love to have, take the gospel to everybody. We love to have people in the church. But when you have a person within the church who is seeking to break apart what God is doing in the church, that person needs to be removed from the church. There's no doubt about what Paul had in mind here. It's the false teachers, the people who have no intent on strengthening the church. They have no intent on establishing the church and helping the church persevere. Instead, they want to tear the church apart with their own false teaching. So these are things that are true about the church that, that Titus was tasked to establish and strengthen and appoint leaders for. These are things that were true then. They're things that are true for us today. And my prayer is that these things would encourage us to the way we should function in the world and we should function here with one another and with ourselves. So continue to read your Bibles. Continue to maintain your prayer life. Continue to be useful for the Lord in the gospel and use these principles to guide you as you do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this church. Thank you so much for the testimony that you gave us, that we can live and be stewards of the gospel here today. Lord, that we can be useful in our own walk with you. We can be useful in our relationships with one another here in the church. And Lord God, our, the nature of our relationship would make us useful in our relationships with those outside the church. I pray for us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to excel still more in that activity. Lord God, I pray that you would make us discerning. I pray that whatever category we were in, older men or younger men, older women, younger women, servants, Lord, that we would see ourselves rightly before you. We would love your word. We would submit ourselves to the authority of your word. Lord, would you make us discerning? Would you make us wise to see the things that are false, to flee from them? Would you make the leadership of this church discerning and wise to protect the dear sheep in this church? I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.